Salam alaikum. Welcome to Kanefa and Shea, a podcast produced for HowlRound Theatre Commons, a free and open platform for theatre makers worldwide. Kunefa and Shea discusses and analyzes contemporary and historical Middle Eastern and North African, or MENA, and SWANA, or Southwest Asian and North African theater from across the region. I'm Marina. And I'm Nabra. And we're your hosts. Our name, Kunefa and Shea, invites you into the discussion in the best way we know how, with complex and delicious sweets like kunefa and perfectly warm tea, or in Arabic, Shea. Kanefa and Shay is a place to share experiences, ideas, and sometimes to engage with our differences. In each country in the Arab world, you'll find Kanefa made differently. In that way, we also lean into the diversity, complexity, and robust flavors of Mina and Swana theater. We bring our own perspectives, research, and special guests in order to start a dialogue and encourage further learning and discussion. In our fourth season, We focus on classical and historical theater, including discussions of traditional theater forms and in-depth analysis of some of the oldest and most significant classical plays from 1300 BC to the 20th century. Yella, grab your tea. The Shea is just right. In this episode, we continue our conversations around theater history with Dr. Samir Asabar for a conversation around resistant ventriloquism and post-colonial courtesy. It is always special for me to be in conversation with Samir because he is both my PhD advisor and one of my favorite human beings on the planet. So here's a quick bio. Samir is assistant professor of theater and performance studies at Stanford and a member of the faculty at the Center for the Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity and the Abbasi program in Islamic studies. Before coming to Stanford, he taught at various institutions, including Davidson College and Florida State University, on a wide range of topics, including conflict and theater, Arab theater and culture, Palestinian theater, performing Arabs, staging Islam and American politics, and Orientalism. At Stanford, he teaches courses concerned with race, identity, and ethnicity at the intersection of Islam and the arts. His international research is focused on the cultural dimensions of the Arab world, the Middle East, and Islamic religion, excuse me, and Islamic regions. As artist scholar, his fieldwork intersects with theater practice as a director and writer. Recently, Samir directed Returning to Haifa at Golden Thread Productions and had the world premiere Decolonizing Sora, a play that he wrote and directed himself at Uprising Theatre in Chicago. Samir, it's so wonderful to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. First, we wanted to talk about your article, Jerusalem's Roses and Jasmine, a resistant ventriloquism against a racialized Orientalism. This article talks about a play that the Palestinian National Theater did in 2015 called Roses and Jasmine, which had Palestinians performing a Jewish majority story on both Palestinian and world stages. This was certainly not a common occurrence, and your article analyzes the choices made in this production, arguing that it reverses Orientalist ventriloquism as a means of resistance. There's a lot to dig into with this article, um, but maybe we can start by just having you describe a little bit of that production with us. Sure thing. Um, it's a beautiful production written and directed by Adel Hakim, uh, actually co-written and directed by Adel Hakim. And um, Adel Hakim uh, passed away a few years ago, and that was the last production he did. Um, he regularly directed um, uh, plays in Palestine, particularly at Al Hakawati, um, the uh, Palestinian National Theater. And uh, he wanted to adapt uh, Antigone. He had directed Antigone a couple years earlier, and the production was so successful. And then he wanted to do something that basically talks about the Palestinian experience using Palestinian characters. And so he did a sort of an Antigone adaptation, and Jasmine Roses was in fact that. And the story follows three generations uh, of Palestinian and Jewish uh, characters that become Palestinian refugees and uh, Jewish Israeli characters. And so you start uh, the first act with uh, the British mandate and a uh, characters falling in love um, 
uh, in the midst of a time of war. And then uh, by the second act, the state of Israel is created. And by the third act, uh, a third generation of characters, young uh, generations, um, who basically are serving in the army, living uh, in Palestine as um, protesters, demonstrators, uh, fighters on some level. So we get um, the the exile of Palestinians in the second generation, and we get the resistance from within Palestine in the third generation. The key to this production is that two sisters, one Israeli Jewish and one Palestinian, have grown up separately in different places. And by the end of the play, they have to encounter each other, one as an incarcerated uh, fida'iye, uh, a, a, a resistance, resistance fighter, and one as an Israeli soldier. And that leads to a kind of um, an agnoresis in the kind of a Greek theater sense, where there's this realization that these two characters are in fact family but they are in two separate positions of power. So what you get is characters or Jewish characters played by Palestinians. And um, because the play begins with the Holocaust happening during the uh, bridge mandate era in Palestine, um, of course happening in Europe, but during that period, um, we see Jewish characters arriving as refugees. And um, these characters are played by Palestinian actors with such kindness and faithfulness that it asks the question, um, why would Palestinians do this? Why would Palestinians tell the story of the Holocaust in a sort of loose adaptation of Antigone in Palestine to Palestinian audiences? And that intrigued me. and. Um, led to my wanting to write a, an article about it. So that gives you an overview of, of the play and why I wanted to write about it. Definitely. So, I mean, let's talk about the idea of ventriloquized characters then, uh, which is a term I believe you take from Edward Said and then build upon. Uh, so you write that, quote, ventriloquizing an oppressive colonial structure, not in mockery, but in earnest sympathy for the purpose of revealing it, constitutes an actual reversal of the Orientalist aesthetic in dialogue, end quote. Can you expand upon that here? Um, you just talked about the earnest sympathy, um, but I'm curious more about how did Roses and Jasmine do this as a, a production? Mm. So um, Edward Said, when he, in Orientalism, the word ventriloquism comes a couple of times. And I uh, was intrigued by that, that, that he would uh, write about a sort of ventriloquizing of Arab existence, aesthetics, characters, uh, but not in earnest, meaning that the ventriloquism is created through an Orientalist filter and fantasy. And it is meant really to reveal something about the West for the West and for the consumption of the West. And in that sense, the ventriloquism is not an honest one. It is seen through a particular filter. And he does not develop that idea within the book, but I saw it throughout the book as a recurring motif. And so um, then I realized that when you, um, whenever as a performer, you are trying to kind of capture a certain reality or realism or naturalism about another character, there is a sort of ventriloquism that you try to achieve that basically without the audience knowing that you are doing it, you are uttering the words of those people or those characters, these types of humans. Now, uh, that could be done for a higher purpose that is actually good, good for us all, or it could be done in a negative way. So um, an example of uh, a ventriloquism that I would say is not a resistance, resistant one 
in the sense that I uh, was attempting to describe, is that uh, you could get Jon Stewart on his comedy show ventriloquizing something that Donald Trump said, but the purpose of it is mockery, right? Um, it's naked, it's in front of you, this is what he's doing. Um, uh, it helps us know what his subject position is as a contrarian and helps us understand what Trump's position is as somebody who is on op an opposing political camp. In Orientalist ventriloquism, uh, I suggest that that ventriloquism is actually potentially done um, with ignorance. I don't want to say in earnest, with ignorance. Uh, but the purpose at the end of the day is always to establish white supremacy that we are better than them. There is an us and them. They are this old culture. They are limited. They, um, all these kind of grotesque Orientalist motifs. But then what if I take that aesthetic and that motif and ventriloquize it for the purpose of putting up a mirror? So the Orientalist can actually see me doing them. Kind of like the white person watching the cakewalk, knowing that it is a mockery of them. That turns into something of a kind of a moment of realization of like, oh, this is how they see me. I must be doing something wrong. That could lead to a realization. And then I thought, okay, what if it's done in earnest, not in mockery, right? This is not, I, I want to show you yourself how ridiculous you are. What if, if it's, I want to show you that I completely understand you, that, that as a human being, I understand your suffering. And as a result, that resistant ventriloquism of showing you that I see everything, I see your argument, I see your suffering, I see your humanity, I see everything about you. And I present that to you as a token to say, look, now that I show you that I understand you, can you do that for me? And in that sense, it becomes a resistant ventriloquism where, in fact, I ventriloquize you honestly in hopes that you will see me for who I am. Because ultimately, most oppressed classes, most people who are suffering, actually tend to understand the arguments, the discourse, the realities of the supremacist regimes that they are suffering under. They understand the tax system of a feudal society and the power of a king and the power of a king in a um, kind of a, a medieval uh, religious uh, dynastic realm, etc. People understand what they're dealing with when it comes to a powerful regime. But very often, those regimes don't understand them. And so uh, that was a point of departure of, of basically um, rendering the, um, the powerful um, uh, into a position where they have to demonstrate understanding for you and sympathy for you because you are openly showing them that you fully understand them. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's what that's about. Yeah. I mean, you describe it so skillfully, uh, and in the article itself, which I'm hoping that people listening will read, will certainly link a place where they can find it. Um, but you talk about how the actors approached this and that not everyone was, I'm from a, an audience or an actor perspective, but not everyone was initially on board or even finally on board necessarily um, because sometimes it, I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you are doing this work um, and doing it in a way that is earnest, it can 
not everyone wants to 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 give that token as you called it um but i'm curious if you can speak more to uh especially because you were there and you were um you know witnessing the production but also in conversation with actors and audience members if you can speak to more of what um the mixed feelings were on having this approach it's a very controversial choice to do something like that because um it it, it puts the burden on those who are suffering to demonstrate the suffering of their oppressors. And so when the majority popular culture sees it, they say, why are we spending our sizable, our sizable emotions, but uh, our limited resources uh, to tell the narrative of the oppressor? Why would we do that? I mean, we have our own struggle and our own resistance. Uh, and so the production itself created controversy for that reason, because so much resources, an entire act out of a three act play was dedicated to demonstrating a Palestinian wholehearted understanding of the Holocaust, the power of Zionism during that period, uh, its connection to Europe, et cetera. And so the, the, there's something particularly in Jerusalem that is really at the forefront of um, a lot of Israeli practices, cultural, political, and so on, um, it was a rejected approach by many of the audience members. But then some d said, no, we need to be able to demonstrate how we understand this narrative and that that narrative actually should not give the right to the people who suffered to ignore our suffering or further aggravate our suffering or to control our lives and, and affect our destiny and self-determination. And so in a way it become the play and the discussions with the audience and around the audience and with the actors uh, demonstrated that theater as a forum can be um, a very, um, eclectic place for making an argument, uh, but also a very uh, combative place when it comes to an issue like the Palestinian identity and the resources of Palestinian theater and Palestinian life and, and the time that actors put in and the audience uh, put in. Um, of interest, the actors who perform these roles are beloved actors who are well known in the community, their commitment to Palestine is beyond reproach. And they felt that by doing this, they demonstrated that the argument that Palestinians um, have a psychological problem with Israel or with the Jewish people, or um, that um, narratives of Jewish history and the Holocaust are not believed within the Palestinian life. All these ideas that are commonly peddled in order to justify occupation, they felt it was important to be able to debunk them. And so that act showing how much the Palestinians understand this, this part of Jewish life uh, was really essential. And it became um, obvious when uh, Jewish audience members in France and in various European cities saw the play, they, they thought it strange how Palestinians could fully understand Jewish European suffering in the Holocaust. And that allowed for grounding of symp sympathy uh, in a way that um, uh, Palestinian audiences, uh, uh, not all of them, saw that as, as something that would, would actually happen. And, and it did. Um, so uh, key to understanding the controversy around that play at that time is that uh, Adel Hakim, the team, the theater, produced this play with audiences abroad being in mind, as well as audiences in Jerusalem also being in mind. Uh, and so it wasn't an exclusively, um, a play that is exclusively created for Jerusalem. It was a play that was created for Jerusalem by Jerusalemites, but also with the purpose of traveling abroad. That's so interesting. And um, so 
carefully crafted as well, the the application of this idea of resistant ventriloquism. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk perhaps more broadly about that term, uh, how perhaps it's been applied elsewhere or how people listening might apply this term in their own theater research or theater history classes um, in other situations, since this one is just so specific and so clearly uh, curated for its the impact that you are talking about? Mm. So, um, I mean, it's uh, it's an idea that could be done in everyday life quite easily, uh, but also in playwriting, uh, in interpreting certain plays. Um, I'll give you the example of Hamilton. Hamilton is entirely a ventriloquism, right? You take w- white American history and you have black performers ventriloquize it, right? However, its problem is that it is not a resistant ventriloquism, right? That ventriloquism actually takes the burden of um, uh, the white master narrative and lays it or superposes it on black bodies. Now, if there had been moments where you might call it alienation or Brechtian moments or moments of just open activism within the play, within the music, within uh, the acting that reveal the ridiculousness of the master narrative, then it becomes a resistant ventriloquism. To, for, for black actors in Hamilton to show how they fully understand in sympathy and in earnest that they do understand the white narrative and where it comes from and the founding of America and so on with with full buying in, but then pulling the rug from under the audience and making a statement about the ridiculousness of that narrative, that's when it becomes a resistant ventriloquism. And so that gives you an idea of how that actually, I mean, it, it exists to a certain degrees and Hamilton is one of them. As a playwright, you can think about it in terms of um, foundational technique in theater making, where you have dialogue typically um, uh, in theater is conflict, conflictual on some level, right? Uh, for the dialogue to work, you have to have opposing uh, points of view within characters, different wants and objectives, diff- different subtext, and so on. But then, if it's entirely conflictual, then you get really good drama, well structured drama. But if you create resistant ventriloquisms within that, then what you can do is you can um, you can uh, 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 decode or unvault or open up a layer that is often rarely used uh, in theater. That is, you can have characters um, uh, repeat repeat each other's sentences, uh, play each other in different times in a play or in a scene. Uh, And by doing so, um, kind of like change each other's perspectives and positionalities. Um, often, particularly in, in common uh, uh, technique of playwriting and realism in American theater, you know, the wants of the characters, you know, rarely change. You know, their subject positions rarely change throughout the plays. Most characters really are something, and they stay the same by the end. You might have a protagonist that experiences a transformation of some kind, but often their subject positions don't really change. With resistant ventriloquisms, you could you could basically uh, upend subject positions uh, in um, in a character's journey quite easily, easily, and you can do it in multiple characters. So that's one way to do it. Um, the best example of a resistant ventriloquism that I have seen recently is Bassem Youssef doing that interview with I forget his name, uh, the British guy, Pierce Morgan. Pierce Morgan, where he, you know, like Pierce Morgan would say something about terrorism, you know, what should we do with the Palestinians? And Bassem Youssef is like, kill them all. Just let's just kill them. Right. And and like, you know, that Bassem Youssef does not feel that way. But by ventriloquizing him, um, he is really putting up the mirror 
and and doing that opposite thing of not creating sympathy but taking on the subject position so Pierce Morgan can see to the point where like he actually Morgan has to say to him like can we get serious right because as soon as you start arguing with yourself and hearing yourself you realize how ridiculous you are and so in that way um, in that way, that resistant um, ventriloquism works quite well. Oh my gosh, Sam, I so appreciate it. I mean, I think that many people listening will be like, oh, that's what makes me feel funny about Hamilton. Or, oh, that's why the Basim Yusuf interviews really were striking such chords with people because it did feel like these major acts of resistance, which usually going on Pierce Morgan does not feel like. Um, and so I just appreciate having this term. And it also, I think this is a great example of how sometimes people think like theory um, or like coining these terms um, doesn't speak to the general public. It doesn't speak to what's happening in the world. And the examples you gave um, and your article itself really point to how you can use these um, as forms of resistance um, in a world where we really need these forms of resistance. Oppressors hate hearing themselves especially through bodies that they hate, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it, yeah, it makes perfect sense. But yeah, well, I want to switch from resistant ventriloquism, which is a term that I love uh, that you, you know, coined here to a different term. Um, but I'll give a little intro for those listening. Um, but two years ago, I had the pleasure of being your teaching assistant for the class you taught in Jordan called History, Urbanity, and Performance in the Middle East. And when we were in Jordan, you were finishing up an article. Uh, so it was really exciting to walk around Jarash, which is known for being one of the largest and most well-preserved sites of Roman architecture in the world outside of Italy, uh, knowing that you were thinking deeply about its history and how the site itself has performed across time. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the term maybe in a minute, but I would love to know if you can share a little bit about what's covered in this article. Yeah. So uh, this article for me um, is, is basically one of those um, projects that started a long time ago. And I was basically waiting for the world to be ready for it because there, were, like, there was no point of publishing something that folks would feel like um, it doesn't make sense or it's out of place and so on. So, um, you know, in my undergrad, I studied in theater history that the Middle East and the Muslim majority countries don't have theater because uh, Islam banned human representation, and the I think the third or fourth uh, edition of the Brocket, that maybe the second, I don't remember, but was in the mid '90s, um, did not uh, 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 actually had like a very small section on theater and Islam, and it was all about censorship, religious censorship, which was running against everything I had known as a person growing up in Arab societies and culture, you know, seeing theater everywhere and seeing people being very theatrical and going to Jarosh as a kid and jumping on those ruins and playing around and seeing concerts. And it's like, how I don't really understand this. Um, and so uh, when I started the project, uh, the predominant belief it, within the theater scholarly community uh, that uh, Islam or Islamic cultures and Arab cultures have had limited exposure to theater and the majority of their theater is either shadow puppetry or um, or uh, kind of a Western inspired theater um, that is only 100, 150 years old was the common uh, argument and, and discussion. Um, and therefore in global theater histories, there was no such thing as the theater of the Middle East uh, in, I would say, nine out of 10 theater programs. Uh, so that's the point of departure of this article of, um, of me saying, well, I've seen the theater of theaters with my own eyes. They are theaters of antiquity. They look like all the theaters that my um, antiquities uh, professors were teaching me Greek tragedies from, uh, telling me all these great things about how these theaters op operate. Um, I've seen them everywhere in the Middle East. How come none of these professors imagined a Bedouin 
walking on the stage and saying something to a bunch of people like how you know like so they passed by those theaters and they were like they were like oh i don't see it you know it's kind of like white people saying i don't see color right it's like oh i don't see it. it's there but i don't see it like is that what it is is that what they imagine uh the truth is um there is a lively tradition of poetic poetry performance very much like the homeric odes uh there there is a huge um tradition of storytelling like greek mythologies uh the concept of strategy of, of tragedy is uh, is extant in historically pre-islam and post-islam throughout arab regions um uh, the pagan heritage of uh, the Greeks and Romans existed in the peninsula, uh, worshipping through um, statues that rep that represent deities and so on. Um, you know, the kind of Dionysian festivals of wine and fertility and theater. Uh, there were similar festivals in the Hauran throughout the peninsula with wine and, and deities and so on, gatherings and and um and markets and uh, recitations of stories and poetry and so you know why is it that theater has been and continues to be in many places to be told as a story of a form that came out of athens uh not anywhere else in the world so that was my point of departure and i thought okay uh well the pharaohs, pharaonic uh, culture is acknowledged. Um, the Isis and Osiris myths was acknowledged, thank God. But then those people who acknowledge it will tell you, well, but you have to know, modern day Egyptians are not the same Egyptians who built the pyramids, right? Like there's a kind of a differentiation of like, no, 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 it's not the same people. The Muslim peoples pre-Islam are not the same people who are after Islam, you know, because Islam destroyed everything. There is a kind of a, a constant uh, diminution and reduction of Arab and Muslim uh, societies uh, in these circles. And so um, I started to ask the question, well, what could it be like? And so I started to study these theaters, and then I landed on Jarash, a city uh, that is part of te a league of 10 cities called the Decapolis. And I um, you know, uh, was finishing that article and uh, during our last visit, um, when we did the study abroad program, uh, after having visited it repeatedly over the years, walking through it and asking the question of like, well, if I were, an Arab from back then, and I walk into the city, what do I think? And th that as a methodology, when it comes to the studies of antiquity, is typically unaccepted. It's like, well, where is the evidence? Well, the evidence is everyday life, anthropology, a human being on two legs, walking on a, on a stone road. Um, Romans did not come from Rome with their stones and put up this theater or the city or these columns it was the people who lived there and so that's that was the point of departure and uh basically once you start a project like that you start asking the questions and looking for answers well the scripts are there we have the muallaqat we have all kinds of stories that have been around for a very long time within the peninsula that were told using oral traditions. The Quran itself is a dialogic text. It's God speaking to the prophet, solving problems about Muslim life. That's the whole idea of the Quran. It's a dialogic text um, that then gets shared, you know, to others and initially orally and then gets written down. And so the whole thing of not having the scripts uh, the building not being uh, the buildings not being ours, and then um, the idea that the, the pre-Islamic Arabs uh, did not even uh, have the desire to imitate. It's like okay, fine. It took us until 1850 to imitate Western theater. Like how ridiculous is that? That the idea that it took us this long to imitate theater. If theater was so great. 
Not a single Arab wanted to do that. That's kind of strange, right? And so, um, so that's what the article is about, is showing what the possibilities are for researching and narrating a potential history of Arab theater pre, um, pre-Islam. Yes. And in the article, you coin the phrase post-colonial courtesy, which I understand as a defense against a certain white classicism that's prevalent in theater history. And you've really told us a lot about the thought process um, of this article, and I can see exactly how this term fits in, but perhaps you can expand upon the term um, because we already see it being done in other places in theater history as well. Mm. Yeah. So um, I noticed early on in my uh, scholarly career that uh, when uh, when folks read my work um, uh, without knowing it's me, they think it's brilliant. But as soon as they know it's me, it becomes uninteresting. Right. That's that's a kind of racism. Another kind of racism that I've often experienced is that uh, when they read it uh, in its initial form, like we all have you know, pre-publication drafts and so on, its initial form, they have all kinds of objections that are like, you tell them I'm writing a piece about Earth, they give you reasons why it's wrong based on the physics in Mars. You know? And you're like, I wasn't writing about Mars, I'm writing on Earth. And so, uh, you know, reasons come up all the time. But then there was a phenomenon that I experienced, which is when I present it at a conference and they hear it through my kind of way of communicating, um, vocabularies that are uh, um, uh, communicated directly to them with my voice, um, uh, with... Um, with control over the ideas at a conference, at a podium, they seem to be more convinced. And what I realized is that to my face, often those listening have a hard time debunking my argument. They have to feel that they are away from me on uh, doing all kinds of crazy homework to try to do debunk, where debunking is the purpose as opposed to learning being the purpose. So with postcolonial courtesy, I wanted to start this article with this idea of asking all these people who are looking for reasons to hate, who are looking for reasons to be better, who are looking for reasons not to learn, who are looking for reason to uh, reduce me to just say, could you please? We live in a post colonial world where we recognize that there were indigenous people in the Americas before Christopher Columbus. Like, can we please imagine that there are indigenous Arabs in the peninsula that actually have brains? Is, is, that, is that possible in a post colonial world? May I have the courtesy of you reading this without seeking to debunk me or reduce me? That is basically the purpose of that, of that idea. And it comes from a long history of, uh, of, I mean, I've been within academia for about a good 20 years, um, a long history of just seeing folks wanting to uh, be experts by not being in dialogue with me, but rather by reducing me as a scholar. And so I, I just request, you know, a basic courtesy during this post-colonial era <laughs> of saying, hey, you know, we have upended a lot of knowledges based on uh, racist epistemologies. Can we do that one more time together? Could you please listen to me without trying to be supremacist or supreme or superior. Yeah. Well, and I think what you're talking about too, we see this courtesy that's extended to different things. So, I mean, Nabra and I are doing this season on uh, theater history, but there are Egyptian, like the Ikronoff Stella, which is in Egypt, but it's a few pieces of text on 
this uh, on the wall uh, and people say like this is very early theater but then that same courtesy is is not extended outside of that time period and outside of egypt uh in different places in the arab world and then the the peninsula uh and so we see this courtesy being extended in colonial ways um but we don't see it being extended in in this post-colonial world so i just i really appreciate you sharing that all with us because i'm sure people listening to can uh, I mean, I, I hope not, of course, but I understand what academia is like often when people are trying to make contributions as you are um, in fields that are not used to um, listening and, and actually are used to having a canon uh, and an ideology that reigns supreme. And honestly, you're just not used to courtesy, which is so interesting. I mean, it's interesting that you even need to coin a phrase of post post colonial courtesy. That's simply really you, you know, uh, you you said it, but also um, danced around it that it's just racism and a lack of courtesy by itself. Um, so uh, it's just such an interesting way to approach it through scholarship, really through in a way it also reminds me of the approach of this resistant ventriloquism is um approaching it through uh from an insider perspective in order to bring uh, a sense of resistance and some type of lasting that's it uh, at the end of the day we basically have to find tricks and tactics to get the person in front of us to just listen to us the way they listen to their white friend or white colleague or white student and so on um, to look at our achievements the way they look at again our uh, artist colleagues and peers who are white um, and the, the idea that we have to do 10 times more and and sh demonstrate 10 times the excellence to get you know half or quarter what our white colleagues get without ever hardly trying is um uh, has become a, a way of life uh and um and you know the resistant ventriloquism sometimes is a way to do that sometimes a post-colonial a request for a post-colonial courtesy is a way to do that but if this racism didn't exist in the first place and if we didn't experience it so much every day we wouldn't be coming up with all these you know, tactics and strategies of just saying, please, 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 please just see me for what I am and who I am. Mm -hmm. And part of that, of course, is documenting these histories and bringing them into uh, scholarship and Western scholarship in it as well. Um, uh, and there's so much to chew on that you've talked about and uh, a really also a great way to frame, I think, this season as a whole, thinking about theater history. Uh, but uh, we want to end by talking about uh, your book and uh, where you write about the history of the Palestinian theater group Al Hakawati in Jerusalem. Um, and we are talking about Palestinian theater in uh, the history of Palestinian theater in Hakawati as a more broad concept uh, in another episode this season. But I know you can't summarize your whole book right now, but can you give us a preview of what we might learn in this text and also any other exciting projects uh, that you're working on now that we can look forward to? Mm. So uh, the book uh, is tentatively titled A Movement's Promise, and it tracks the movement of Palestinian youth in the early 70s after the 1967 war and the uh, events of Black S September where so many uh, Palestinians were killed. Um, they felt a certain par paralysis and wanted to, in the absence of a vacuum of power within uh, Palestinian society at the time, immediately after the occupation, uh, they wanted to um, reach each other and uh, do work together. And uh, theater was a great medium because what it requires is uh, the ability to tell story or the desire to tell stories and to be in community with each other. And so although assembly typically was banned by law, uh, by military law at the time, uh, they found ways of connected, connecting through the YMCA, through um, various um, uh, private organizations and familial circumstances. That group of people would create so many theater companies and have so many political viewpoints and ideologies 
all um, nationalist in some sense, in terms of desire for Palestinian self-determination. But at the end of the day, some were communists, some were leftists of various kinds, some um, sympathized with the uh, 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 Popular Front, uh, others with Fatah, others with, you know, different factions. And that group of people, uh, their theatrical productivity increases over time throughout the 70s. And uh, at some point, a company called Al Hakawati emerges that is essentially a natural extension of many of these companies. And parallel to it, other companies emerge doing also, um, uh, you know, their own theatrical ventures, but in different ways. Um, you know, Al Qasaba's George Ibrahim does amazing work uh, that is parallel to Al Hakawati. Um, the People's Theater, Sanabil, does a whole bunch of amazing work. And so all that leads to what I call, what they, re, re, uh, the, they refer to as the theater movement. The theater movement um, ends up having this, you know, um, uh, highly productive period in the late seventies. El Hakawati becomes the leading company, and they end up f uh, founding, creating this theater in an old, burned-out cinema, where they go in and fix it up. I mean, if you see photos of this thing, it is absolute destruction. It had rockets thrown on it. It was burned. I mean, it was just a vandalized, destroyed place. And they turn it after six to eight months of work into a premier theater venue that continues to survive till today. They just celebrated their 40th anniversary. And so um, El, El Hakawati and the theater movement ends up creating this beautiful home that becomes a center of cultural production. And the 80s end up being this very productive period, having more theater produced in that city than any other time in history. And then um, some internal disagreements happen after the Intifada, when there was a real promise of a the creation of a Palestinian state. And it becomes uh, a really complicated question as to whether this theater will remain as it is, uh, led by the Hakawadi Theater Company, or uh, it'll be taken over by, uh, you know, uh, like a board, and uh, it becomes, therefore, the nucleus of a potential national theater for the Palestinian state that was supposed to be established with Jerusalem as its capital uh, in the Oslo Accords of 1993. And so, El Hakawati is given the choice to either remain as the as the head of this organization and take responsibility for all its financial costs, or to leave it. They were artists, and um, you know the relationship between administration and artists is always complicated in the theater. Uh, and I'm simplifying uh, how they exited, but they ended up exiting the theater. And, um, and it was taken over by a board that has sustained it in some fashion since that time. However, the Palestinian state never came to fruition. Oslo ended up creating all kinds of problems. And instead of the promised 90s of a Palestine with a self-determination and a ministry of culture and uh, with, with a vibrant uh, Jerusalem uh, that had uh, all kinds of um, performances in dance, poetry, theater, etc., cetera, uh, music uh, in El Hakawati Theater, it ends up being that this theater is surrounded uh, by checkpoints and, uh, you know, lack of access. The rest of the West Bank cannot go there. And it ends up being in a status quo, a kind of no man's land. Um, and so that's essentially how the book ends of like, at, at this period, when the movement's promise does not come to fruition, what is the future of that theater? So uh, that's the book. Of course, part two of the book would be, the next phase that Palestinian theater ent enters, which is, say, 93, 95 until now, which is a period of NGOs and internationalism and international funding and all kinds of crises 
uh, that include the Second Intifada and all the bombings against Gaza for the last 20 years and so on. So um, that would be part two <laughs> if we were to have one. Yeah. Well, I really hope there is also a part two. So we're looking forward to both parts and um, so thankful for this entire conversation. Uh, there's so much to chew on, so much to think about, and so much also, I think, for us and our listeners to look more into and to especially read. You've given us a real reading list of your articles here that we're, that we're very excited about. Uh, so thank you so much, Samir, for joining us today. It's so, so, so grateful to have you here and so thought-provoking. Always. Thank you, Samir. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. This podcast is produced as a contribution to HowlRound Theatre Commons. You can find more episodes of Kanefa and Shay and other HowlRound podcasts by searching HowlRound wherever you find podcasts. If you loved this podcast, please post a rating and write a review on your platform of choice. This helps other people find us. You can also find a transcript for this episode, along with a lot of other progressive and disruptive content on the HowlRound.com website. Have an idea for an exciting podcast, essay, or TV event the theater community needs to hear? Visit HowlRound.com and contribute your ideas to the comments. Yalla! Bye! Bye.